welcome everyone um i'm delighted to be the moderator for a session on an exciting uh, intellectual personality like ak ramanujan um for those of you who may not have known of him he was one of the most versatile intellectuals we have seen the folklorist linguist anthropologist poet writer and translator um so we have this big book that was recently written by guillermo a study of his poetics so ramanujan wrote poetry in kannada and in english and he translated medieval poetry as well as classical tamil poetry uh, really the range is rich and overwhelming um and grish karnad who knew ak ramanujan extremely well um is also important for this book guillermo has been in touch with him since his ma days when he wrote his dissertation on a poem of ramanujan called snakes in the mid 90s after which he went on to do a bit, uh, many years of dissertation work which also took him for the first time to ak ramanujan's personal papers at the university of chicago many many cartons of them so it's a very special occasion that we have um girish and girmo with us girmo could you start by reflecting something about how girish came to matter for your work hello is it is it working okay fine um i'm i must say one of the great claims i can make about my life is that i have met a lot of very intelligent and creative people through my life very great people people who have uh, uh played a very important li- uh, part in the history of our uh, country of our culture during the last 50 years but there are very few whom i would call whom i would call a genius you know probably half a dozen that to me and one ramanujan ak ramanujan was one of them and he remained my guru right through and i take great pride in the fact that i met ramanujan when i was 16 uh, i was a student and he was a junior lecturer in english in um, in a place 48 miles away belgaum and he used to write poetry and one was struck by his intelligence of course one thought what a uh, uh, extraordinary mind but he he also did very funny things he did things like he collected riddles he collected proverbs he you know and um, uh, he did translations from vachanas all of which seemed to us completely irrelevant but one knew uh, one was just impressed by his coruscating uh, intelligence and I stuck by him and right through my life i have followed him for as a translator i followed him as an ethnographer as a poet he has influenced my writing and so on and so on and so on uh, so this is really a tribute to ak ramanujan now as for demo rodriguez um it is very strange how we met because i first heard of him by his name someone called me from kerala <coughs> a person called me from kerala and said here's this uh, spanish person and he wants to talk to you and then uh, he came and he said i want ramanujan's poetry ramanujan's poems so in fact even before we met i think i sent him some drafts of ramanujan's work ram he was fascinated by ramanujan's work even then we met much later and i'm glad to say that i was able to put him in touch with the ramanujan's son and his family in chicago and and one of the great regrets of ramanujan in his life was that while he was recognized um um as a very important intellect in chicago he didn't get any recognition in india during his lifetime now ramanujan's sister is here saroja and um, uh, well i'm glad to have you here to uh, saroja and um, <clears throat> i remember saroja saying to me you know raman always felt that he's never recognized here that he's only recognized abroad and this is true here in karnataka and so on his proverbs and his uh, this seemed unimportant at that time uh, until he you know he, now of course he's recognized as a major figure and um, um well it's 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 an amazing example of a person who developed and along with him developed his entire culture so i won't go on from that he was a great poet he was a great translator he was a great ethnographer 
the marvelous thing about him is uh, uh, translations is that not only did he translate from usually when people translate they translate well known works they translate bhagavad gita shakuntala and so on but he translated work which was then completely unknown vachanas which were unknown outside karnataka and sangam poetry which was unknown outside tamil and made them his translations convinced us that it was great poetry uh, it, 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 that is something quite extraordinary and uh, the amount of effort he put into it well i won't go on we'll talk about it later but i want to ask gmo to start off because it's a very strange journey for a young man from spain to come to india fall in love with an indian poet and then produce the first book in fact um, on ramanujan which should have been written by an indian actually if um, but uh, to be have written and published by oxford university press um, i'm glad to say i had something to do with it um, well of that later gamo to you son thank you girish thank you uh, chandan and also thank you saroja for being here i remember meeting you at your home long time ago and you gave me some cassettes of his readings etc well it might be a little strange uh for for somebody from spain to approach a writer from your region like ramanujan in fact i'm very excited to be here today for the you know thank the, the festival for having invited me this is the first time i talk about this book and ramanujan in the canada speaking world i've been uh, invited to festivals all around the world in the us uk europe spain other parts of india and i can assure you that ak ramanujan is always full house there's so much interest in his work and this takes me you know um to give you a little bit of a glimpse of my own personal experience and then how i figured and found out uh, how important ramanujan is today and how relevant he is to so many other who call themselves disciples of ramanujan as girish was saying i was a young student uh, traveling with uh, my girlfriend then my wife monica was also here today she's a dancer she performed yesterday at bharatiya vidya bhavan um we were traveling overland to india to explore different cultures different ways of looking at the world and we arrived in india after a few months and i remember stopping at a bookshop in benares and there was this uh, incidentally bookshop owned by a spaniard and he said you should read this and i picked up three four books and i had never heard much about indian literature one was by girish and it was hayavadana another one was 10 indian english poets which was uh, edited by r partha sarathi and the other one was speaking of shiva which is uh, ramanujan's perhaps best known books of translation which became a cult book in the hippie years in the 70s which even um, influenced ted hughes by the way i figured out later so you know going through these texts and i had no idea that girish was of course ramanuj is one of his best friends what immediately struck me by i had no idea that um, he was also an essay writer at the time the essays were not published i'm talking early 90s and this was the same week that ramanujan had passed away july 1993 one of the reasons his work was left unfinished is because he passed away so early you know under going undergoing surgery in chicago so i read his poems and i figured immediately there's something magic about them there's something that is different from the others because it had they, they have so many layers from somebody who was a student i'm a student of english literature american literature uh british literature you could feel that there was a magic quality there were layers in the poems that brought you into a whole mythology a whole story and they were playing tricks on you because i later figured out that he would he loved magic tricks so the poems were so well crafted i had also been trained as a linguist in edinburgh university i was trained as a style you know to learn stylistics i had been analyzing poems for years as a student and here's an indian poet who you know is able to pull off the magic trick of writing a poem about an indian topic which has so many undertones and undercurrents this particular poem on snakes uh which which struck me which is like a riddle it it really goes deep into another world so to sum up to me poetry and ramanujan became the window 
into the entire Indian civilization, one has to find a way to understand India as a foreigner. For Monica, my wife, it was dance. She figured that as a drama student, she, she could learn more about learning Bharatanatyam and Kathakali. To me, it was literature and poetry. And interestingly, coming from outside, but not precisely the Anglo-Saxon, you know, I'm not British, I'm not American. <laughs> and I could see India without that bias, perhaps. There was no colonial vision from my perspective. And I later learned, reading his essays, that he called himself the hyphen in Indo-American studies. He was a bridge builder. He was somebody who could speak to a Spaniard, a French, an American, anybody outside the culture, and drag you into the Indian culture in such a magic way. And then the poems and his entire work is a whole body of, there's a coherence in his entire work. The poems speak to the essays, the essays to the, the translations to his, own, uh, to his own works as a translator, essay writer, and poetry in his own right. So I began a journey. I joined Loyola College in Chennai, where I studied MA. And I remember my tutor, my teacher then saying, what topic have you chosen for your dissertation? I said, I'm just going to analyze one poem. It's a poem, Snakes. It took me 100 pages to analyze that poem, stylistically and also from the content point of view. Then um, I shifted to Kerala. I didn't know Girish at that time. I was living at Cholamandal Artist Village with, with Monica, where Ramanujan had read, he had had his last poetry reading because uh, in, in, in December 92, in at Cholamandal Artist Village, just by chance, a few poets, S.G. Vasudev, whom I also would like to thank because one of his pictures are in the book, and Vishwanadan, they said, why don't you read some poems? And that was his last poetry reading that was recorded, December 92. And a few months later, I actually arrived there by chance. I had no idea. I was not on the Ramanujan trail or anything at all. It just, things just happened magically. And from Kerala, I decided to use my previous work to write a dissertation, PhD dissertation on Ramanujan. Now, I'm a very stubborn Spaniard, so I tried to meet everyone who knew Ramanujan everywhere where he had worked. You know that he taught... Uh, even in, at Koilon, he had friends in Kerala, he had connections with Kerala. He had, of course, I went to Mysore, I met C, uh, Naras, um, uh, Narasimha, Sidi Narasimaya, who um, you know, was his teacher, in fact. I went to Mysore, Dvanya Loka, Bangalore, I met T.G. Vaidyanathan, I then you know, uh, tried to meet Girish, but he was always traveling and working on some film or something. So I could only call him from Kerala, and he happened to come for some sh film editing to Kerala, and then I met him. He was not, um, Girish at the time was a little skeptical. What's the Spaniard doing trying to research a book on Ramanujan? But a Spaniard <laughs> writing about Ramanujan. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, but I was, as I said, I was so stubborn, I kept calling him, visiting, and uh, of course, in Chennai as well, traveled all over India, and this is a time when there was no internet almost, it was starting. So you had to actually go to those libraries and research centers. And I developed this allergy, you know, these old books everywhere and newspapers. You had to really go. That was the real research, you know, uh, the romantic way of doing research. I actually sent you Xerox copies of yes. poems this thick <laughs> because there was no other way to send them. So to cut this uh, story, long story short, uh, you know, once I had gone over most of the things that could be done in India and research uh, his papers uh, that were left, uh, you know, in India. Uh, you know, Girish said to me, you've already met everybody you had to meet here. Why don't you go to Chicago? Because at Chicago, he had been t teaching for 30 years, and a lot of the people that were worked with him were still around. So I asked for a scholarship from my university, got on a plane, uh, went to Chicago and in the year 2000 or 2001, and I could not imagine what I found there in his papers. A uh, few years before, um, Molly Daniels, his ex-wife, had left the papers, and that was a very wise decision, had left his, all his papers with the University of Chicago. I think that's one of the things the really American universities do very well, you know? Somebody becomes part of the legacy of the university. Mm -hmm. And you are able to go there and research his papers. So we're talking about 30 linear meter of boxes. And they had just been left there. They had, I was fortunate enough to go through them before they were actually filed. Because after researchers go and classify everything, you don't find it in the same place. So I found things as Ramanujan had left them. And there I was 
stunned by, you know, first of all, the, uh, the, 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 the output, the level of writing, because he did published only very little, in, in fact. You know, he was very, very demanding with himself. There were many drafts. There was a body of poetry that was never published. He had uh, wanted to publish something called Soma poems, on the idea of Soma, where inspiration comes from. But I think he was a little afraid of uh, being connected to Aldous Huxley, you know, and the whole idea of Soma. So there was a lot of self-censorship also. He didn't publish many poems. There were a lot of poems that were also quite, uh, you know, erotic in tone as well, which he did not publish. And then all his diaries. The diaries are a new entry point because all he, from the beginning he kept a diary. He had left some behind but went back to them in India. So from the 1949 till virtually before he passed away, the entire diary, uh, diaries and p notes he had are kept there. And of course that gives you an entire new viewpoint into what he thought about himself. And I can assure you, he f foremostly he thought of himself as a poet. His thinking is as a poet. Even when he writes prose, he wants to play with the reader. He wants Can you read something from the diary? Of course. Yeah. I will read something. I just want to mention one more uh, aspect here because this was the first time nobody had written about the papers. So uh, I was the one who, who tried to bring them out. And I think in this book, uh, one of the uh, you know, advantages is that you can see some of his text, and I'll read some of them next to his poems. You, 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 you understand his thinking because he never wrote about what he thought as a poet. You know, some poets like to write about their poetics. You know, even Nisim Ezekiel wrote, Arapartasari wrote, you know, how one should write. Uh, but I want to end this introduction by saying, you know, that uh, his poetics are in his entire work. He speaks about it more specifically in his diaries. But one of the things that I would, again, like to stress is, you know, I think when he passed away, there were, there were a lot of tributes to him in newspapers. But as Girish said, uh, he felt that he was not receiving the recognition that he was, he got the big MacArthur um, uh, uh, award. It was the biggest research award in the US. And, and, and he thought that, you know, he was constantly coming back and forth, but his, his work was left unfinished. But I would like to finish this introduction by saying, uh, there was a small piece uh, of his, I think it was Anantamurti who wrote, the importance of being A.K. Ramanujan. Why is he so important? Why is he so relevant? Of course, we can revise his work from a postmodernist point of view, but we're looking, I mean, he was a pioneer in the 60s and in the 70s when Indian studies in the West was basically, especially in the early 60s, just Sanskrit studies. He brought Dravidian studies on the map. He started with a few other scholars, the Dravidian anthropology, Dravidian linguistics at University of Chicago. And he was able to bring an entire tradition of Kannada Vachanas, of the Sangam Tamil poems, of the Alvar poetry, into basically almost the mainstream academic life and even almost into pop culture, like speaking of Shiva, the poems and some of his own poems were just all over the place. So he was able to bring that into the discourse of Indian studies and the whole idea of India not being monolithic, not Sanskrit, but the dialogue between the, the, the Marga and the Deshi and bringing in a viewpoint. He was doing even something that today we would call gender studies in his analysis of women's stories and women's tales. He was doing something way ahead of his time. And he was doing things that today we would call subaltern studies or women's studies. They wouldn't call it that way. And when he was doing uh, uh, researching and collecting folk tales in India as a young uh, professor, he was doing, uh, you know, anthropology. He said he was. He met an American. Said, "What you're doing is is anthropology. <laughs> you're doing something." I think. I think reference to this while you're mentioning it, I should mention that there was a distinct anti-Sanskrit feeling in Ramanujan's uh, theorizing. He felt that Sanskrit was never the mother tongue, while Ramanujan was concerned with mother tongues. He was concerned with literature in Tamil, in Kannada, in you know, all, all languages, in Telugu, which were the mother tongues, and he felt that Sanskrit had produced a kind of a formal, formally structured literature which was away from the lived uh, realities of the people. And that sense you get in his, in, his, in his writing and all that. And therefore, when he looked, sorry, I don't want no. to take a, um, he, 
he he went to women's tales for instance he said if you want to understand kannada culture you have to go to the stories that were told by women old and he was the first person to draw attention to the stories that were told by old women in kitchen and relate it to to take that story and say how that story a story a grandmother tells a story to a child how the child picks up that story how it develops and ultimately it may become the basis of a epic you know and this connection between larger culture and the spoken idiom this is a great contribution of ramanujan to the yeah. big thing so the the what he called the akam and the puram you know yeah, yeah. Uh, you won't believe it but a lot of the indian folk tales in spain my country are only known because his collection was translated into spanish Mm. So when somebody says, "Oh, Indian folk tales," yes, I've read the book by Ramanujan, folk tales mm. from India. It was translated into Spanish. So here again, both at the popular readers' level as well as you know in the academic spheres, where a lot of his his concepts were applied and are used as meta language today, and were applied across disciplines. For example, Akam and Puram to classify not only genre of po poetry in the Sangam tradition, but also to be applied to folk tales, or the idea of mother tongues and father tongues, the idea of permeable membranes, that literature is not static, that it's a network and, and a confluence of, of a living tradition which, which just feeds into it. Because I wouldn't say he's anti-Sanskrit, counter. He preferred the word counter, counter structures. You know. So it's something that you know feeds each other there there's a constant dialogue between of course he highlighted and foregrounded always the 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 south and the underdog and i remember when i was doing my when i sent this first in to uh, pub, be published by oxford university press there was a reviewer remember i shared it with you girish one of the reviewers he was very critical of ramanuja not of maybe my study he said why are you always highlighting the dravidian and not the sanskrit you know he felt yeah, yeah. he must have been some pandit who was you know of a different viewpoint but it's it's ridiculous because if you working on something that you want to highlight and foreground it doesn't mean you know you don't acknowledge the the sanskrit he had a lot of friends wendy donegar sheldon pog they were all sanskritists but they looked at sanskrit from a different perspective he, he himself had exchanged lessons with sheldon pollock he would teach sheldon uh, canada and sheldon pollock would uh, teach him sanskrit because he had not studied sanskrit uh, in a, in a formal way is one As, point sorry yeah. that you made that i would like to ex just to show how ramanujan thought because you made this. you see ramanujan studied these tales told by uh, old women in kitchens to children in the youth and he found that all these tales that they were they had no names you know it was all about there was a, a, a dhobi and he had a wife and he had a son and that whole folk tales that he covered the oral tales he covered had no names of who the king was or who the prince was or what his name was but when you found the same tale in a public sphere when you found it being used as a part of a ritual and so on it got names you know the, there was a city called ujjaini there was a king called vikramaditya you know often you found the same story but as told by uh, the old women it had no names no decorations but in the public sphere it got and then to his surprise quite unexpectedly while he was translating uh, tamil poetry he found that the same thing happens in aham and puram you know uh, there are these aham poems which are very personal poems in tamil uh, you know of uh, what she said what he said and there are no names it's all about what a girl says about her love to her friend or what a mother says about the son who has gone to but there are no names at all but when you come to the puram poems they're full of names and full of descriptions and he you know and he suddenly saw that there was a connection between private world nameless world and a public world full of names now this was ramanujan i'm just mentioning it as to illustrate the point which is that something that he sees in a kannada kitchen he will apply to tamil scholarship you know and illuminate a whole range of studies and show things that had not been noticed before sorry so uh, we come to some of the readings now uh, i will try to read some of the fragments where he speaks first about himself as a poet what he and inspiration he was very obsessed with the idea of you know how art and writing 
became, you know, how it came into being. You could also say that his influence from the, the sh you know, uh, Vachanas and from the Lingayats and the Alvars also influenced his poetics. And you could somehow say that it is a rom romantic perspective. I would not even say that he was classified. And you, if you're students of Indian literature, you must have learned drama literature, some of you, at school. They may tell you he was, you know, he was a modernist along with the Minister Ezekiel, Giv Patel, uh, Merotra and so the, uh, all these other poets. But I think you should study his poetics also because I would go beyond that. I would say that he was a bridge between the Romantic, the Modernist, and the Postmodernist tradition. He spanned all three. Why Romantic? Because what is Romanticism about? Romantic is, in the sense it was born, the German Romantics, what did they do? They went back to their sources. They went to the Nibelungen. They went to their uh, medieval stories. And he was exactly doing that. He was going to the Middle Ages. He was a romantic in that sense, uh, not a revisionist. He was going back to that. Then he was a modernist because as a linguist and trained linguist, he wrote in the idiom of Eliot and Pound. Of course, he did. And he wrote with a, maybe a Western reader in mind. And then he was a postmodernist because he, re he revised his ideas. A lot of his translation theory has been maybe criticized or analyzed from a different perspective. He was a structuralist. Yes, that, that was his his intellectual ethos at the time, but he went beyond that. And in his last work, you can feel in his poems, you know that piece where he, um, uh, you know, the last collection of poems, which was published, uh, Second Sight was the last one he had pub published in his lifetime. Initially, it had, it had been one long piece of poems, but he suddenly chopped it all into pieces because he thought it was more a la par with the ideas of Bart and, and Christ Christeva and, you know, post, uh, so fragments. Truth is in fragments. So he chopped it all up. He didn't want people to feel that, oh, this is very T.S. Eliot, and, you know. He had his own idea. So Before you read, you just mentioned his interest in the past. Somewhere in the book you say, uh, as a poet, he was, a, he was riddled with anxiety about his multiple pasts. Can you say a little bit more about what tradition meant for him? As a, and you also said once, interestingly, that he was also conscious of having created a tradition. Yes. I mean, if you can reflect on Okay, this. then that has... That's the connection with him as a translator. Then start with that. Um, for him, the past and memory is, 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 is one of the main items in his poetics. Of course, you mentioned anxiety. His, his poems are full of anxiety also, of pain, yes, especially in the last part of his life. What is his anxiety? Uh, one of his uh, main preoccupations was, how do I make tradition alive today? How do I bring it alive? He, was, he, saw, he thought you have to translate the reader, not the text. But his own problem as a poet was that he was so envious of these masters that he wanted to inscribe his own work in that tradition. That's, but the only way it came out often was through irony. So he started writing these mock poems, you know, uh, prayers to Murugan, Lord Murugan, but in, a, in, a, in an ironic mode. He had shunned his Brahmin, uh, Brahminism in, 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 uh, when he was 16, so he didn't uh, want to attend his father's funeral rites, and he was, he was very much uh, influenced by the revolutionary ideas of the Vachanas and Basavana and so forth, even in, those, in his teens, you know, it was a very crucial time. We're talking about 1947, 1946, this is India's independence, so that's another reading, of course, you know the struggle between his own, you know, how, how he found an identity, he found it in, he had a professor who had taught him the Vachanas when he was 1947, and I think that at the same time he, got, he became very critical of the orthodox Brahmanism as he was reading those texts. So all throughout his life, even as a poet in English and as a translator, his notion was to inscribe himself in that tradition. And his first translations were not really translations, they were transcreations. He was playing around with those poems. He was doing versions of those poems. And I'm going to read a few of the phrases where he explains that anxiety because he felt in his idea of tradition he was more aligned with T.S. Eliot who said that you can change Pound and Eliot, tradition and the individual talent. You know, history is not like a line which goes forward. You can also influence Shakespeare, you can influence uh, the Sangam tradition, you can, you can have a dialogue with those traditions, and you, by doing that, as an individual, you are somehow changing the tradition also. It's not something static, you can have a dialogue, you can change it, you can refer to it. And I'm going to now, re to answer your question again. Uh, of course he said, 
the struggle was also about being faithful to the original and being uh, free, you know, uh, between appropriation of the text and being, you know, only a transparent uh, intermediate. So it's always, uh, the motto was let poetry win without allowing scholarship to lose. He was a scholar and a poet, so that's one of the tensions he had. Scholarship and poetry. If you want the scientific method and the mystic inspiration, there was always that tension also. You, can't, you have to be somewhere in the middle. You know, only poems can translate poems. You know, there are so many translations around. They, they, they're dull. They might be dead. You have to bring them alive. But at the same time, you do it through language. You do it through something that you have to touch, you have to feel. He has an interesting... Um, um, poem where he reflects on that idea, ironically again, and which I will read now, uh, because it all has to do with repossession, you know, possession. He was uh, obsessed also with the idea of possession. He analyzed folk tales and uh, ritualistic uh, processes which happen in, in, in folklore as well as in the Alvas, you know, where the poet suddenly becomes possessed uh, by, by the, you know, the genius of, 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 of the creator, whatever you want to call it, the name. Krishna or any, any other name, possession. Uh, so one of the things he said in the poems was, in, in his ironic, typical, uh, this is from Second Sight, as I transact with the past, as with another country, with its own customs, currency, stock exchange, always at a loss when I count my change. I read it again. As I transact with the past, as with another country, with its own customs, currency, stock exchange, always at a loss when I count my change. So he felt that being a bridge builder, you always lose to some extent. You know, you're neither here, neither, you always lose something in between. You can't be, it is never perfect. You know, a translation can never be finished, only abundant. A poem can only be abundant. That was, he was interested in the drafts also. And I'm going to read another piece where he, uh, if you agree, yes? Yes, okay. We'll go through. So as a translator, again, some of his ideas which uh, reflected on his vision as a poet also because he could not not tell one from the other. Okay. So in a way, this is from his diary, 1984, one of his 1984 Chicago diaries. Uh, and this is part of the book in, in the I.K. Ramanujan papers, University of Chicago. In a way, one needs the other, even if it is the mocking other, to find oneself. To find oneself. One needs the other. The English language in America itself has been that other to me, which has returned us to our dream. He had discovered Tamil poems in the Chicago library, you know, and he had, he's dreaming about that all the time. So I quote again Ramanujan, as a translator, one, translate, one translates to repossess one's past. Not only to realize the pastness of the past, but the presence of the past. But it's in America, the other, that I learned to do it. Though I had begun much earlier. And in this business of translating and retranslating from one tradition to another, funny things happen. What happens? What is funny about it? I'll give you an example. The dialogue between his own poems and his translations. So there's this, I mentioned the Soma poem earlier. I'm going to read one of his unpublished uh, Soma poems. So Soma for him is, you know, it's the elixir and Soma is, is a god also and supposedly what you took, you know, some people say when he was studying Soma, uh, Wendy Donig had just published an essay saying that Soma is a mushroom. So there was a lot of talk what Soma was about. And, and, and he himself, in, uh, this is also in the book, in 1971, uh, had experienced, for, for a brief period of time, he was going through a depression. He had just divorced Molly for the first time, and his family was away in India. He had experienced with, um, with, uh, with mescaline. You know, mescaline, uh, just took some mescaline just to see how, as Aldous Huxley had done 10 years earlier, but he was doing it on his own. So he was scribbling down his experiences, his visions. It was just a one-time experience, which I think to some extent he regretted, but he scribbled a lot of the poems 
that, that came out of that, and some of them were published later, so you might find some surreal ideas in, in Second Sight which are traced to that. So he says in one of his drafts, Soma, no mimic similar, has no similitude, grows ordinary as mystery. Ancient familiar, the always here. Soma is the same as you and you and you when you make the right mistake and find your best attitude. So, poets, beware. And here he links with his poem. Poets, beware. Your life is in danger. The Lord of Gardens is a thief, a cheat, master of illusions. He came to me, a wizard with words, sneaked into my body, my breath, with bystanders looking on but seeing nothing. He consumed me, life and limb, and filled me, made me over into himself. Okay. Uh, what, I, have, I have been influenced by Ramanujan Rao all his life. And one of the interesting things about him that was mentioned is that he wrote about his own anguish quite a lot, but never revealed himself. So he always used to be fond of quoting Oscar Wilde, who said, you have to wear a mask to reveal yourself. You know, the mask is what tells you. And in many poems, in many... Uh, uh, so I'll just quote one poem which I love. Are we out of time? No, no, no. I'll mention one poem which seemed to me always Ramanujan because he was very intense. And when I knew him, when he was in his 20s, he was struggling with his relationship with women, uh, you know, the sexual, uh, uh, this. Then he went, he went abroad, about which he would talk and not talk, both of this. So there is this poem which I think talks about his personality. It's called Yet Another View of Grace. And he went to America and he found things within him that he couldn't suppress. And this is what the poem says. <clears throat> I burned and burned. And one day I turned and caught that thought by the screams of a hair. And I said, stranger, beware. Do not follow a gentleman's morals with that absurd determined air. Find a priest. Find any beast in the wind for a husband. He will give you a house full of legitimate sons. It's too late for love or even for treason. And I have no reason to know your kind. Bred Brahmin among the singers of shivering hymns, I shudder to the bone at hungers that roam the street beyond the constable's beat. But there she stood on that nightlit April mind and gave me a look. Commandments crumbled in my father's past. Her tumbled hair Suddenly known as silk in my angry hand, I shook a little and took her behind the laws of my land. That's the poem. So, you know, the, when I, what's interesting is that when I, I, I love reciting this poem, and when I recited this poem to Ramanujan, he said, it shouldn't be so dramatic. <laughs> He was always con yeah. contained. Yeah. Room temperature, Girish. Room temperature is enough. <laughs> so, so I said, now look, you don't catch someone by the screams of her hair at room temperature. <laughs> now, this is the kind of discussion that goes on with him, which made it so uh, fascinating. Great. So let's end with this piece on what he felt as, about his anxiety about writing. And he, I will, uh, he explains it in, a, in, a, in his diary piece, and then he does it in, this, in a different way, but in a a uh, beautiful way in, in one of his last poems, which are also about anxiety. Let's read that piece. Let's let Ramanujan be the, his last word. <laughs> 30th October 1976, Northfield, Minnesota. I've never thought of myself as a writer. I just write. I'm startled when someone introduces me in print or in conversation as a poet. One is a poet only in the poem. Poets are specialists in what everyone does all the time. The poems, too, when they come, surprise me. I feel a poem has chosen me, not me, the poem. And this is not being mystical. 
I have the same feeling about thoughts, ideas, events, persons. Maybe a certain passivity and need to say, I didn't work for it, I'm not responsible in my nature. For years, I took the Buddhist slogan, take nothing that's not given, literally, except I reversed it to take everything that's given or say no to nothing, which landed me in dreadful dilemmas with food and women. <laughs> Poetry happens unbidden and has to protect itself. The psychedelic experience taps precisely such experiences, but the junkies seek it as a separate state and not as an interruption of the ordinary. Perhaps that is what grace is all about. And this is where the ironic distance comes in. My point is, you can't seek such a state. You can't organize it or take a pill for it. The extraordinary occurs in a most ordinary fashion. Something like the way a poem happens. It's a mystery, but mystery itself is ordinary. Only we make of it something miraculous. Yet one works for grace in some secret way, works at it as one does at a poem that has come to you. As Pasteur said, chance favors only the prepared. And the poem I want to read is The Black Hen. The Black Hen. 1992, this is the published draft. It must come as leaves to a tree, or not at all. Yet it comes sometimes as the black hen, with a red round eye. On the embroidery, stitch by stitch, dropped and found again. And when it's all there, the black hen stares at you with its round red eye, and you're afraid. Thank you. Um, we have come to the close of the session. Please join me in thanking Girish Karnada and Vidya Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, there's no time for a question, unfortunately. Just one question, yes. We'll repeat the question, just ask. And he worked in uh, Madurai for one year, you may know. And that could be the reason why Tiagaraja College always arranges special conferences on A.K. Ramanujan. And also, I, I represent uh, Skillet, Study Center for Indian Literature in English and Translation of American College. And, you know, students are Quickly, case. it's the one minute is running out. What's the question? I, I, uh, no, this is just a I comment. did part of my research there, in fact, at Skillet. Yeah, he so. used to go to Vaigai River. To he has Skillet. a poem on Madurai, as you know. Yes, In yes. Madurai, I saw the steel clench of a leper's claw, he says, <laughs> you know, obviously. So oh, this is just a comment to say that he was very much recognized during his lifetime in Madre, I know for certain. Thank you. Well, let me comment on that, which is just that when I handed his poems over to my general manager in Oxford University Press then, saying that, you know, can we publish him? The general manager, who was an Englishman, said, oh, this looks like uh, prose lines cut up to look like poetry to me. So I said, uh, well, I think they're good poems, and I sent them to London, and I'm glad to say London published them. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.